Good morning. Welcome to St. Mary's on the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This morning's lectionary readings are an interesting collection. Jesus is telling yet another parable, this time about the weeds that are sowed in among the good seed. And again, he explains the parable in some detail to his disciples, but not to the rest of his followers. And also, we are continuing our journey in the book of Romans, where Paul is, is laying out the plan of salvation as he sees it, our utter dependence on God through faith, and how God's action of grace is what truly saves us through the mercies, intercession, and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But of the lessons appointed in this morning's pericope, the one that captures my imagination the one that really drew me in was the story from the 28th chapter of Genesis of Jacob's dream of this amazing ladder leading to heaven with angels ascending and descending upon it. Jacob is a central figure in the relationship, the covenantal relationship of God with Israel. When his father Abraham first received the promise from God to make them a great people, Abraham knew that it would fall to one of his sons, either Esau or Jacob. They were twins, born at the same time and late in life for both Abraham and Sarah, that one of them would be his heir, one of him would be his successor. Who would God choose to continue his promises and his conversation? And he chooses Jacob. And Jacob is always the slightly more devious of the two brothers. The one who really gets into more trouble, has lots of problems, and is even threatened with death. And in the 28th chapter of Genesis, we pick up Jacob on the lamb. He's running. He's trying to escape those who are out to harm him. He's exhausted. And we get this story of this dream. When I was looking at this in more detail, it's a familiar story and one that I, is very close to my heart, I was digging around to find some new way of looking at it, some perspectives I hadn't seen before. And I came across a commentary by Juliana Clausens, an Old Testament scholar, who not only, I think, shed some insight into what's going on in Jacob's life, but also does a really fine job of outlining Jacob's role in the nation of Israel. And I'd like to share some of her work with you this morning. Juliana Clausens writes, in the lectionary reading for today, we encounter Jacob on the way. Jacob is portrayed as a fugitive, fleeing for his life, a vagabond somewhere between a conflict-ridden past and an uncertain future. At exactly this point of limbo, landlessness, rootlessness, and no real prospects for the future, God meets Jacob at a place of no particular significance and transforms it into a house of God. The pericope starts with a flurry of activity when at least eight action verbs are used in the first two verses of the reading to describe Jacob leaving Beersheba and going to Haran, stumbling, literally striking, upon no particular place, and because the sun was setting, staying there for the night. Here, Jacob took one of the stones of the place, put it under his head as a pillow, and went to sleep. 
Amid this fervent activity of a man on the run, as is evident by the death threat in the previous chapter, a dream that mirrors that flurry of activity of his waking life interrupts Jacob's sleep. He dreams of a ladder that reaches to heaven with angels, messengers of God, going up and down on it. Now, one probably should not think of it as a ladder in that contemporary sense of the word, but rather something more like a ramp, a structure that served as a divine sanctuary through which heaven and earth were connected. This stairway or ramp or ladder to heaven does not give Jacob access to heaven. Rather, God speaks to Jacob where he is, denoting God's imminent presence rather than a faraway removed God calling to Jacob from a distance. It is significance that this surprise encounter completely comes from God, breaking into Jacob's state of sleep, which signifies a brief cessation of his anxious fleeing. In this divine speech, God reiterates the promises that God made to Jacob's ancestors, Abraham and Isaac. And with, his, with this gesture, God emphasizes that God is not only the God of the first and the second generation, rather, at this point at which Jacob is the most vulnerable, God asserts that he is also the God of Jacob. This promise of God is the reiteration of the promise of a land of their own that has repeatedly come through Abraham and Isaac. And another direct or indirect promise of becoming the father of a great nation. God's promise to Jacob also contains the final statement regarding the nations being blessed by means of patriarchs and matriarchs, a powerful reminder that Jacob's life should not be governed by self-interest and self-aggrandizement, but becoming a channel of God's blessing to others. Moreover, God promises Jacob that God will be with him, a promise that is even more imperative given the fact that Jacob is traveling far away from home, entering an unknown future in an unknown land. This promise of God's presence and protection has deep roots in Israel's communal memory. The beautiful priestly blessing from the book of Numbers that holds up God's safekeeping and blessing in the wilderness, as well as in Psalm 121, a psalm of ascent which prays for God's protection along the way. A promise that is unique to Jacob is that God promises to bring Jacob back home. A promise that speaks to Jacob's unique circumstances of being a man on the run, but also a promise for the displaced community in the exilic context in which the Pentateuch probably received its final form. This is, makes it all the more poignant. When Jacob awoke from his dream, not only the place had been changed by God's presence, but also Jacob is a changed man. Professing God's presence in this rather ordinary place, Jacob builds an altar, converting his pillow, just another stone from that place, into a type of memorial that marks the life-altering encounter with God. He calls this place without a name Bethel, House of God, professing that God is here on the way right where Jacob finds himself. It is significant that God's interruption of Jacob's anxious journey, which displays God's renewed commitment to Jacob in his own right, does not contain a word of judgment regarding Jacob's prior actions with regard to his brother and his father. Rather, God's address to Jacob contains one unconditional promise after the other. In this grace-filled encounter, we see how God can transform an ordinary stone and an ordinary place into something special, a place where God's presence has made a home in the world. Similarly, this trickster who has deceived both his father and his brother 
and who since birth has lived in strife with the people around him, can be transformed by God into a richly blessed man who serves as a source of God's blessing to others. Finally, the lectionary text in the 28th chapter of Genesis attests to the ability of an alternative reality to break into a world of fear, terror, and loneliness. In this text, Jacob's dream, which he dreamed somewhere in the middle of nowhere, permits the dreamer to imagine an alternative way of being in the world. As the dreamer is encompassed by God's presence, he has a transformative effect in the waking world. We too are weary. We too are fleeing. We too are pursued by an invisible enemy these days. And many of us, probably most of us, are also dreaming a lot more than we have been. Could it be that God is reaching out in this very ordinary place in the middle of nowhere to very vulnerable, ordinary people like you and me, breaking into our dreams to transform us as well, to help transform this world in which things seem all topsy-turvy and inside out, a world of divisiveness, a world of rancor, a world of mean-spiritedness, a world that seems to be lacking the love and the grace and the beauty of God? Could it be that God is working on us in this place, at this time, on our journey, to transform us so that our very ordinary lives may be transformed and become a blessing to others, as was Jacob's? What will be our memorials to this time and this place? What will be our talismans and touchstones of our time and place on this journey? What will be the transformative future that God is calling us and fitting us for? How will we remember? How will we be remembered? How is God reaching out to you and to me here and now?